You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached the age of 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health podcast. My guest is Irbo Abasi, Assistant Professor at Columbia University Medical Center. We're going to be talking about tissue engineering of human hair follicles uh, using biomimetic, meaning mimicking biology, uh, approaches. So, Irbo, thanks for coming. How are you doing? Good. Thank you, Richard. Uh, thanks for inviting me. And I'm very excited to be here on this podcast today with you. Yeah, I've heard of uh, people wanting to engineer skin, you know, 3D print skin, grow skin for burn victims, et cetera. But why the why a hair follicle? Why is that so important to, uh, you know, skin itself? Well, um, skin is actually a very complex organ. Um, it is composed of many different components. You know, um, when you think of skin, it's, it's not only the epidermis and the dermis. Um, uh, it has vasculature, for example. It has pigmentation. Um, it has um, innervation, for example, sensory neurons, and it has this uh, mini organ uh, called hair follicle. It, it is actually a very complex organ by itself. And, um, you know, hair follicle is also a functional, uh, functional organ that, that talks to uh, other tissues in the skin. Um, it talks to, you know, it communicates with the uh, blood vessels, for example. It can uh, induce the formation of blood vessels. It can, uh, it, it talks to other, uh, other types of skin tissues, such as the, you know, the epidermis and all the other sensory neurons, for example. There is some sort of communication between, between these three different components of, uh, of the skin. So hair follicle is, um, is obviously is also a very, um, like important for aesthetic reasons. Uh, people uh, lose their lose their hair uh, because of uh, sometimes because of uh, you know androgenic alopecia uh, you know, like this is uh, male uh, pattern baldness or you know it can be alopecia areata uh, which is an autoimmune disease um, you know that is causing um, these hair follicles to uh, to shed uh, in both in uh, females and males so it's a, th- those are very uh, especially for for young people those are very devastating. Um, you know, diseases to address, or in burn patients, for example, you know, uh, when you uh, when you have a third degree burn on your scalp, uh, for example, versus on your uh, somewhere some other side of your body which doesn't have any hair follicles on it, you want to restore it, you want to replace it, replace it with engineered skin uh, that has all these uh, functions and uh, you know uh, components to it, so that you can have a fully formed and functional uh, skin that matches also. Uh, you know all the uh, other um, the properties uh, of the of the site where you have the uh, burn on. So, does the uh, hair follicle act as a transport mechanism of material in and out of the skin, or what? You know, what are the different functions that uh, people have figured out so far? Well, um, my research is actually uh, looking into more um, more um, of engineering of uh, engineering of the hair follicle. Um, I'm 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 actually uh, an, an engineer by training, um, and I got interested in the skin um, four years ago when I joined uh, Dr. Angela Cristiano's group at Columbia University. She is a world-renowned uh, expert in hair research, and uh, I learned so much uh, from her and um, um, in the lab uh, at, at Columbia. Uh, from the dermatologists, you know, hair researchers and uh, skin researchers. My, my um, 
uh, I'm not a hair biologist, so I'm not, I mean, uh, I'm not the, uh, you know, uh, best person to talk about uh, hair biology, but um, so from literature, we know uh, that it, it signals, for example, um, the, the uh, specialized um, um, cell type of the hair follicle, which is, uh, which is called dermal papilla cells. This is a mesenchymal cell type that is uh, embedded in the dermal compartment of our, of our skin, and that is close to the hair bulb, uh, and it's, it directly interacts with the epidermal cells overlaying it. And we know now that uh, the, the, the keratinocytes, the epidermal cells, as well as these dermal papilla cells, they can signal uh, through, uh, through, you know, uh, for example, they can signal uh, vascular endothelial growth factors and uh, other growth, important growth factors that can induce uh, blood vessel formation because this is this is highly important for the regeneration of this tissue. Uh, you know we have hair cycle uh, going on throughout our lifetime, and um, this endless cycle uh, to has um, uh, you know different phases. And in the antigen phase, which is the growth phase of the hair follicle, uh, they th this process requires uh, new newly formed um, and uh, newly formed blood vessels and a constant supply of bl uh, blood to the tissue to, to have enough nutrients to complete this regeneration properly. So for this, for this regeneration purpose, uh, dermal papilla cells and keratinocytes, they, they signal, uh, they basically secrete proteins into the, into the dermis and attract basically uh, blood vessels uh, that are, that are uh, embedded in the, in the dermis uh, of, our, of our skin. So they attract their own blood vessels, I mean, like, wait. You know, hair grows in existing skin. Um, mm -hmm. So you're saying that as it grows, and in order to grow, it's attracting vascularization to itself continuously. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good because I know that's a, a tough problem <clears throat> with a lot of tissue engineering is getting adequate vascularization. So if you can understand that process, perhaps that yeah. can be used, you know, for other tissues as well. Exactly. So what makes the uh, the hair follicle so complicated? What is it about it that uh, it's tricky to, to make. Yeah, it's, it is super complicated. It's a very complex organ. Um, it is uh, composed of, when you look at it closely, it's composed of at least eight distinct cellular layers, um, you know, of these cellular, these are epidermal layers, uh, and they're specializing, you know, for, for different functions, and they have to be generated uh, at the right space, um, you know, at the right time. So this, 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 is what makes it very difficult to generate. Also, uh, to to achieve this uh, specific, you know, differentiation, uh, you have to have a certain interaction uh, between uh, these epidermal cells and the un uh, underlying dermal papilla cells I just uh, told you about. So th that's how uh, hair hair formation um, occurs in the body. You have these um, aggregates of dermal papilla cells. In the dermal uh, in the dermal compartment, and then on top of that, you have the keratinocytes. Uh, then these two cells have start to talk to each other, and then this makes them uh, grow uh, down into the dermis, so it ex extends. And wh while it is extending, also these keratinocytes are differentiating into these specific uh, distinct cellular layer layers to to form the hair, um, you know, hair a complete hair follicle, and when you look at the hair follicle, you can also see these little pockets, uh, you know, um, attached to it. Uh, for example, there's spacious, uh, sebaceous glands. They, they are the fat factory of the hair follicle. They're super important for the hair follicle. Um, you know, it, give, it gives the, you know, the greasy, um, um, you know, function to it. And then uh, there are the stem cell compartments, for example, in the hair follicle, because it, 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 it's a constantly regenerating organ. So you have to have specialized compartments of for stem cells uh, in certain locations of the hair follicle. Um, so it, it, it's very complex uh, and, and very uh, actually difficult to engineer. Uh, and the main challenge is actually, you know, when, when these cells, uh, especially dermal papilla cells, when they are taken out of the body and put in culture to expand and uh, later to put back and, uh, you know, together with the other cells and engineer the hair follicle, when, when you start culturing these cells on plastic dishes, they lose their uh, genetic signature. So they lose their function com almost completely. So 
one challenge is to uh, restore this function on, uh, on this multiplied expanded cells first, so that when you put them together with the other cells, they can start the physiological uh, interactions and uh, start uh, forming hair. So that was one of the challenges that we uh, encountered. And, um, and we used a genetic approach uh, to reprogram the cells uh, by, uh, by overexpressing some, um, some, uh, some genes, including LEF1, uh, in these culture dermal papilla cells, which gave them um, the ability uh, of hair induction. Uh, and then we use these genetically um, um, manipulated, if you will, uh, cells to, uh, to engineer our uh, hair follicles using 3D printing. So what's, uh, what are some of the specific roadblocks in engineering the hair follicle? Like what have you been able to do and what's still the challenge to you? Well, there's still so many um, remaining challenges. Um, what we've shown in the paper is, um, so we've been able to use 3D printing um, to you know, achieve the right conformation or arrangement of cells to, uh, to grow hair. And then we take these constructs and we, you know, uh, we either leave them in vitro completely in the lab, you know, without putting them on, on, on uh, animals. Uh, we were able to grow human hair in, in vitro without uh, any grafting. And then we tried to also graft it onto mouse and we, we, uh, we were able to grow human hair efficiently on mouse in these constructs. But the challenge here is, when you compare the efficiency of hair follicles you get uh, when you graft them onto mouse versus the efficiency of the hair follicles you get in vitro is completely different. It's much higher in the in, in vivo when they're put on, uh, put on animals. And this is not surprising. It's not like, it's not uh, only specific to hair follicle, you know, hair engineering. It's, it's a general um, um, thing that we don't fully understand why we can grow uh, better tissues uh, in a graft when, when they're you know, grafted onto animals versus when we keep them in, uh, in vitro. And we don't know uh, exactly the formulation, you know, the, the, the chemical and the, uh, physical signaling um, that happen, uh, happens in the, in the body. If we figure this out and if we can recreate this signaling in, in vitro, we'll be able to grow as efficiently uh, hair follicles um, in vitro. And this is, uh, as an engineer, for me, it's, uh, this, uh, this is real tissue engineering. You know, uh, for clinical applications, of course, you will have to uh, put it on the patients and it will work much better. It, it, it is good, which is, which is great. But then um, to be able to engineer a tissue completely without you know, uh, exposing it to any, any body or any micro environment, that is uh, that is a dream uh, for me in this uh, line of research. Well, cells communicate with each other, so you know, there's this cell-to-cell -cell communication that's instructing and giving feedback to the, uh, the follicle on what to do. That's probably why in the dish it doesn't grow properly. Yeah. Plus, uh, you know, we in the in the media, you know, where we where, what we use uh, to culture the cells in. Uh, it, in in this study, we only use a plain medium, which is which means that we don't have any growth factors or any soluble factors in it to induce, you know, to enhance the efficiency of this uh, hair growth. Um, as opposed to, you know, in, in mice, there are all these growth factors coming from the surrounding tissue, uh, in the other components that I told you about in the skin, or even from other organs. You know, from, from, we know that organs in the body, they communicate with each other. So they, they're communicating through blood vessels, through blood, and, you know, it, there may be a signaling that we are missing that is coming from, you know, liver, for example, that is released into the bloodstream and then that goes to the uh, skin and uh, induces hair follicle formation. So, um, so now we're starting uh, to add all these important um, soluble factors and growth factors into our media uh, to achieve the same, uh, with the same efficiency in nature. Well, does this work on mice? Are you like immunosuppressing the mice and then grafting on uh, stuff to make you grow like hair follicles and skin or how's it working with mice? Yeah, we, we, we did it on mouse, um, correct, uh, in, in the efficient mice. Uh, and, but but we, we did it also in vitro. I, I mean, I'm just uh, talking about the efficiency. We were able to grow uh, human hair, with, with fully formed human hair with a hair shaft 
in the in, in vitro for the first time. And actually, when I saw the first time growing, uh, you know, a hair fiber coming out of our constructs, I was uh, running in the in, in the lab and you know yelling to people, you know, first hair, human hair, and people came around and take pictures. You know, it's uh, it was amazing to me to see even one hair growing out of our constructs. But now I want to imagine uh, the day where we we would see, uh, you know, hundreds of hairs coming out of our constructs. Like it, like it does in uh, in mice. Well, in terms of like the vascularization, what's the um, the size of one hair follicle versus the amount of vascularization it needs? You know, from what I've heard in other tissues, you get more than I don't even know if it's as much as a millimeter, but a very small distance away without a blood supply, the tissue dies. So, what's the size of a hair follicle relative to that? Yeah, that's that's a very good question. Um, um, I don't I don't have a clear answer to how many like what would be the amount of blood vessel you would need to uh, you know uh, supply enough blood to a certain number of, or like certain thickness of hair follicle or certain length of the hair follicle with certain number of cells. I don't have an um, uh, you know certain um, answer to that, but it, it is very important. So what we did. Uh, in the study was, um, you know, first we tried it because first we didn't have any vasculature in our hair bearing uh, construct. So directly we, we grafted it onto mouse and it didn't grow any hair. So, uh, in, and instead when we looked at the, uh, you know, graft, we saw necrosis. So the, the tissue was dying, basically. Our graft was dying um, within, a, within a week. And it's not, it's not long enough for hair, hair follicles to grow. So we said, maybe we can vascularize this. This, is, this needs blood vasculature as well. So uh, using, you know, uh, our previously established uh, vascularization methods, we also added engineered blood vessels into, into these hair bearing constructs. And when we repeated the same experiment, when we grafted them onto mouse, then our tissue remained alive long enough and it gave our hair follicles enough time to, you know, uh, grow um, and uh, form uh, fully formed hair follicles. So it's uh, definitely um, very important to have this vasculature. The amount of vasculature we didn't really look at the uh, the uh, extent and uh, you know uh, extent of these uh, vascular networks. We basically seeded endothelial cells. Uh, we embedded them into the dermal compartment and we induced them to spontaneously form uh, blood vessels and blood networks. And then what we saw after we grafted them uh, on these on these animals. Uh, these human engineered human blood vessels, they combine, um, they merge with the host, uh, host vessels. So basically mouse blood uh, was running through our engineered blood vessels, which, which was supplying uh, nutrients to, to the skin uh, for their survival. But again, they were not uh, hair follicle, uh, they, are, they were not blood vessels that, that, uh, around the hair follicles. They were or randomly distributed in the dermis. So if you can find a way to get them closer to the hair follicle in the right amount, or in a sufficient amount at least, you may have this ability uh, to, uh, to rege regenerate uh, and um, have the ha uh, hair, cycle, uh, hair follicles undergo hair cycle um, more number of, you know, higher number of, number of, numbers of times. Oh, wait a minute. You said the blood vessels are randomly distributed and what about uh -huh. mapping the hairs? What about looking at a sample of skin and mapping the hairs and then mapping the blood vessels and seeing there's a correlation? It probably must be. It can't just be random and the hairs are there and some vessels are far from hairs or some are close. And you know, there's got to be at least some proximity in order for them to grow. Yeah, there's something definitely that uh, we can look into. And I'm sure we'll see if you... Um... Uh, if you see any, you know, like if, if you see them closer to the hair follicles, I'm sure, uh, I'm sure you'll you'll see more uh, hair cycling there and a more uh, survival of the uh, cells and more dividing cells and uh, better uh, reservation of the uh, um, stem cells of the hair follicles. And we didn't, uh, we ha we don't know yet uh, how uh, many cycles uh, our hair follicles can undergo these engineered hair follicles. Um, uh, we, we have to monitor them uh, long enough because human hair cycle is very long. Uh, it's not like mouse hair cycle, which was, uh, you know, only for weeks, but human hair follicle, uh, hair cycle is, uh, it takes years. So it takes years for, for us to, uh, you know, uh, figure that out. 
how long it, it goes. Hold on one second. So um, question about your constructs. What is it constructed of? What does it look like, your, your constructs so far? So our constructs uh, are composed of uh, collagen type 1 gel, which is a hydrogel, and which is the most abundant um, extracellular matrix of the dermis. Um, these are coming from rat tail, um, and uh, we have dermal fibroblasts embedded into, into this uh, 3D hydrogel. And in this hydrogel, we have our micro wells, or you can uh, think of them as micro holes, uh, which we made by uh, using 3D printing. And in those holes, uh, we uh, add our um, keratinocytes and dermal papilla cells. Uh, and then they settle down into this channel. When they settle down, dermal papilla cells settle down first because we seed them first. Uh, they uh, go in, they sink into the channel they, where they form these spontaneous aggregates. And when they form the aggregate, actually, they restore uh, their, their hair inductive properties um, um, partially. And when they do this, after they do this, we add our keratinocytes on top and they start. Um, communicating with each other. And um, that's, uh, that's how um, we form our um, constructs and that's how they, how they look like basically. Um, so basically a hydrogel with micro, micro patterns and inside the micro patterns, we have two different cell types. And inside the, um, inside the hydrogel, we have dermal fibroblasts. And when we, have, when we want to do the vascularization, we add also endothelial cells together with the dermal fibroblasts. So we have, uh, at least four different cell types to start with uh, in, a, in a physiologically relevant uh, extracellular matrix. Are you just trying to grow the hair follicles amidst the soup of the cell types? Or you, do you have a piece of skin and then you're trying to grow a hair follicle on the edge of it or in the center of it, let's say? You mean um, growing, growing, these, um, growing hair on a piece of skin that, that is uh, that's harvested? An existing piece of, on an existing piece of skin, yeah. Maybe that's a, that would tell you something different. You know, even if you had like a small skin island and you try to grow hair in it or through it or on the mm -hmm. edge of it, it's just an idea for a different type of construct, you know, instead of a soup of cells. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if we um, collected skin, let's say mouse skin or human skin and, you know, uh, make, make a, like a, do a punch biopsy or like make a hole in, in the middle of it and then feed our um, construct. Uh, or see ourselves in there with, with this within this hydrogel, uh, with with the signaling coming from uh, from the surrounding tissue that you uh, that you collected, uh, I wouldn't be surprised that um, that would um, that would enhance uh, enhance this process because of the signaling that we just uh, talked about previously. You know, you're basically um, uh, isolating some of that microenvironment and then uh, you know doing your experiment. Um, Although uh, you know incomplete, still in a, in a, in a, in a natural environment, um, and more natural than uh, uh, what you have in uh, petri dishes or you know plastic culture dishes. Well, it sounds like you want to find out the minimum required to grow hairs for hair follicles. So you know, again, if you started out with a real small piece of skin with you know one or two hairs in it, maybe that's enough, and that would help you grow a whole bunch more, and then you'd be off to the races. I don't know. That it, it just seems like it would be, a, you know, you know, the mouse model works, you know, when regular people, it works with all the factors. And then you, you, you know, you're trying your soup of X number of cells and that's kind of working. So maybe take a few intermediate steps and try to interpolate so you can get closer to what you need faster. Just an idea for you, you know? Mm -hmm. um, well, maybe, I, maybe I'm simplifying it. And it's much harder to do that than it sounds. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure if I completely understood uh, your uh, suggestion. Uh, well, so that's what I was asking. What is the, does the construct have any shape to it, or is it just cells, you know, in a medium that are free floating and they're just all, they're all just sitting there in a small area, and from there a follicle forms, or do the cells have structure when you're trying yeah. to grow your hair follicle? You know, what does the construct look like? Maybe a little bit of detail besides just the cells that are involved, like. What does it actually look sure. like? Does it have structure when it starts out? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, thanks for clarifying that because I didn't uh, really talk about the geometry and you know, how it looks actually. Uh, it's hard to tell, you know, without, without pictures. But uh, so, um, so we basically 
have uh, a transfer, we call it a transfer uh, culture system. So it is a transfer, it's, it's like an insert that we put in a plastic dish. It's, it's, it's a circular um, um, well, uh, and then it has uh, a membrane attached to it at the bottom. So, uh, and then this is suspended, um, you know, uh, in a culture dish. And in the circular transfer, we add our hydrogel, uh, which is a liquid form first. And this liquid form, in this liquid form, we have the dermal fibroblast, and it gels first in the in a circular shape, you know, taking the shape of the uh, of our transfer. It's around two, two centimeters in in diameter. And once it gels, once it, once it's solid, um, you know, the actual before it, it gets solid, we put our uh, you know 3D printed molds. Those are plastic molds that you know that have the hair follicle like extensions on them. We put them on top and they float these these molds. So and they have the you know hair follicle extensions. And once we uh, once the gel, this uh, hydrogel forms around these uh, hair follicle like extensions, we can peel off the molds. So we we get rid of the molds from top. And now now we are left with open channels on top. So we are left with open holes that look like hair follicles that have the geometry of the hair follicles. For example, these holes are around, you know, 300 microns uh, in, in diameter, and they have, they're around four millimeters in, in length. And we could control these parameters with 3D printing, and we could control the hair density, for example. We can make different shapes of, different uh, patterns of uh, hair follicles with this technique. So it's, it's a basically, a, um, you know, a, a solid uh, circular shape Two uh, to around two centimeter diameter in size, um, uh, it, 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 const it constructs, and then um, it, then you add yourself into it, into those holes, and then they start communicating with each other, and then they grow more. For example, you may start with a four millimeter, uh, you know, uh, in length uh, of 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 micro channels, but once the cells, uh, you know, start uh, differentiating, they can grow like they do in uh, hair morphogenesis during, you know, uh, embryonic development, uh, they grow down into the, uh, into the dermis. So in this case, they're growing down into our constructs, into the hydrogel. So they're, they're elongated, uh, starting from four millimeters, but then they become much longer like they do uh, in the body. And they can have an angle also. For example, we start uh, with an with a 90 degree angle, this is, uh, these holes are perpendicular to the surface of the uh, gel. But then uh, once these cells start, um, you know, interacting with each other uh, and start their differentiation and hair growth, they can change the angle. They can become more, they can pick up a more physiologically relevant uh, angle. So what we found in our constructs actually, after a week or so, uh, we have uh, around 45 degrees of an angle uh, of these hair follicles when we image them in 3D with using 3D uh, imaging, you know, confocal imaging, uh, we saw that these, these hairs now have, have an angle that, that is mimicking the physiological um, angles of the hair follicles, which this was to our surprise. We started with 90 degrees and then um, they, 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 they somehow uh, find the right angle when, when they start forming. Yeah, that's really interesting. Makes me think of plants, you know, that, that go towards the sun. I wonder why hairs uh, will go from 90 to a 45 degree, and in which direction, and if they change direction. That's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Okay. And we well, can, you know, like, with sorry, uh, with this with these models now, uh, since now we have all these in our hands, you know, we can start asking these questions and answering some of them, you know, that we we weren't able to answer before because in humans we don't have much knowledge about human skin. We, what we've done so far, we, well, we know so much about uh, mouse skin, for example, or you know, rodents or anim other animals, but we don't know about human skin that much, human hair follicles that much, and how, how these things form you know, during embryonic development, for example. Now we can look into, you know, we can monitor what happens in the early stages of uh, hair follicle development. So what's, uh, what, what's your end goal? What would be a great result for you, you know, in the near term, in the next few years for you to figure out? Well, first of all, I would love to see um, uh, very uh, like love to see how um, we can grow 
uh, hair follicles in vitro completely uh, without having to put it or grafting it onto mouse. So finding the right formulation um, to have in our culture medium that would uh, you know, enhance this efficiency of uh, hair growth, human hair growth uh, in vitro. So that would be, uh, that would be my um, goal, let's say, for the next two years, which, which, which we're uh, working on currently. I mean, we have many different projects going on in our department and in my group, but this is the most relevant one uh, to our topic, to this topic. And uh, I would love to see that uh, happening. And uh, also uh, another thing that we are looking at is uh, now, uh, the, as I told you before, a hair follicle is not only uh, you know, uh, composed of a hair shaft and you know, uh, eight layers of uh, epidermal cells and dermal papilla cells, you have the other compartments. For example, there, there is the stem cell compartment. There is the sebaceous gland compartment, which is the fat factory of the uh, you know, hair follicle. So adding these components to hair follicle um, will make it uh, a full, fully formed hair follicle. It's a, a physiological hair follicle. So I want to add all these components. For example, uh, there is also pigmentation, right? Uh, we don't now the, the the hair that we grow is unpigmented, so it's white hair basically because it doesn't have oh, the really? yeah it doesn't have pigment it doesn't have you know the uh, pigment uh, uh, pigment making cells which are melanocytes. So these melanocytes are located at the hair matrix above the dermal papilla cells and inside the uh, epidermal uh, compartment of the hair follicle. But in this study, we didn't. Uh, incorporate any any uh, melanocytes into those channels. What is possible? It's possible to layer all these cells on top of each other in the in the formation that is uh, in the, in the in the body. You know, uh, so that's one of the goals. Also, uh, now we want to add these melanocytes and get pigmentation and grow um, hair, uh, colored hair. Oh, for listeners, what's the best way for them to learn more? Maybe see pictures of what you're working on. You know, read papers. What's the best way for people to find out more? Uh huh. Uh, well, they can they can um, check out our new paper in uh, Nature Communications. It it's um it um got published uh, late last year, uh, December in December 2018. Um, and they can also check out um uh the video uh that is on uh that is on Columbia University's website. Uh, we uh. So Angela Cristiano, she was the corresponding author uh, of this paper, and she talked uh, uh, about uh, about the study, the details, and then I'm also uh, on that video talking about you know the the engineering part of this uh, part of the study, and they can learn much more about um, about the study on that video, which was shared with, uh, with with the rest of the media actually. It came up on, uh, you know, in, in different countries, also in the media, and, uh, you know, uh, sometimes with uh, very exaggerated titles, which I'm not very happy with, like Cure for Baldness, you know, the end of baldness. Uh, so uh, th those are unfortunately uh, not very uh, accurate titles. Well, very good. Well, Erbo, thanks for coming on the uh, podcast. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much, Richard, for having me. It was really uh, nice, to, nice to talk about uh, with you. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. 
No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.